Welcome to Messages from the Bowing Place. You know, the tongue is an amazing little thing. It looks so harmless. Yet by the tongue, one can command, control, and rule the nations. Did you know that by our tongues we can curse or bless? Think about the word damn, for instance. People use the word damn quite broadly, but what does it really mean? Well, the word damn is short for damnation, which means to suffer horribly in hell eternally. So damnation has to do with a falling from grace that involves an eternal suffering and punishment of the spiritual body, not the physical body. Yet oftentimes people use the word damn as a command in order to force physical conformity. In fact, have you noticed the amount of public damning by doctors, politicians, and people in general that's going on all over the media these days? I mean, it seems like every time you turn on the TV or read an article, someone is publicly damning you to conform to the majority. This kind of public damning is a way to disgrace and shame others publicly. You see, public shaming may be something that is new to you, but actually, public shaming is nothing new at all. It's been going on since biblical days, and it's still happening today. For example, the Amish use public shaming and shunning as a punishment for those who marry outside of the Amish faith. To shun means to persistently avoid, ignore, or to reject. Hmm, who do we know that suffered rejection? Well, Jesus, of course. Isaiah 53, 3 says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. But you know, Jesus was not only publicly rejected, he was also hated and repeatedly told to leave the region where he was. So the people of Jesus' time not only took offense at Jesus, but they hated him and they were enraged at him. Therefore, it would be foolish to think that you, as a servant of God, walking in the will of God in these last days, would not also have to experience public rejection, shunning, hatred, and anger. Why? Because in John 15, 20, Jesus said, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. In fact, Jesus warned us that public rejection, shunning, hatred, and anger would be coming our way. And it is. In John 15, 18 through 20, Jesus said, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. It says, remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. And in John 15, 25, Jesus goes on to say, they hated me without reason. You see, hatred, rejection, anger, and disgracing are all part of shunning or public shaming. They're emotional weapons which are aimed at the masses in order to make them conform to a certain system or ideology which heavily relies on social control in order to work. So why exactly does public shaming work so well on conforming human beings? Well, because we're like sheep. We like to flock together. Remember when you were a kid in school how you never wanted to be the odd man out? You always wanted to be picked for that sports team, invited to the party, and you were inclined to do anything to conform in order to be a part of the crowd, a part of the majority. 
I mean, every kid's worst nightmare is to be left out or rejected and not to have any friends. And it doesn't change as an adult. Most people want to be a part of the in-crowd. We want to belong. We want to be liked. I mean, for goodness sake, what's the first thing that every person on any public forum says? They say, please, hit the like button. Yes, it's human nature to want to be liked, to want to be popular. None of us want to be hated and rejected. This is why we are so affected by the supercilious behavior of others. Supercilious means behaving or looking as though one thinks one is superior to others, acting coldly or patronizingly proud. In fact, supercilious is derived from the Latin word supercilium, which means eyebrow. Have you ever had someone raise an eyebrow to you and it lets you know that they disapprove of you and disapprove of your thoughts and your behaviors? Supercilious people can be extremely insulting. But the Bible reminds us that as believers, we are required to speak the truth regardless of what, what it may cost us. Like so many other believers that came before us. And we're expected to speak all that we are commanded to speak by the Holy Spirit of God. Whatever he tells us to say, we are expected to say it, regardless of how people look at us or what they say to us. And the Bible says not to be dismayed by their looks. For example, Jeremiah 117 says, Now belt your garment around your waist and arise, and speak to them all that I command you. Speak to them all that I command you. Do not be dismayed before them, or I will make you dismayed before them. Well, what does dismayed mean? Dismayed is defined as to ruin the courage of someone, or a sudden or total loss of courage, or to be appalled, horrified, or shocked. In fact, the strongest concordance word for dismayed in relation to Jeremiah 117 is chatteth, meaning to be shattered, broken, cracked, frightened, or terrified. So when Jeremiah 117 says, do not be dismayed before them, it's saying, don't let your courage be shattered, broken, or cracked, so that you become frightened or terrified of their looks. And not only their looks, but also their insults. Do not allow their insults to shatter, break, or crack your courage, so that you become frightened or terrified by their insults. Just imagine how people must have looked at and insulted poor Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego at the time when the majority of people around them were bowing down to false gods, but the three of them refused to do so. You see, they knew the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They knew the God they served. Therefore, they simply just refused to bow down like the majority of people around them, regardless of the looks and insults that they received. They didn't do the easy or the popular thing, which was to join in with the majority. No, instead, they had the courage and boldness to go against the majority. Just imagine the public shaming and ridicule that they faced before they were thrown into the fiery furnace. But also imagine what they must have felt like after they got thrown into the fiery furnace, but yet were not harmed. So if you can't think of anything else while rebellious people look down on you, insult you, treat you horribly, or attack you physically, then think on Matthew 5.11, which says, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. I'll read that again. Matthew 5.11, which says, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. You see, supercilious people are boastful and arrogant. We're seeing a lot of this behavior these days, not only within the general population, but also within the medical, political, and religious arenas worldwide. 
So why exactly have so many people developed such a super superiority complex? Why do they look down on others with such prideful, arrogant looks? Why do they act so coldly and patronizingly proud? Well, because we're in a time of lawlessness, a time of a lack of love, and a time when people seek to benefit themselves first, above all. Matthew 24, 12 says, Because lawlessness is increased, the love of most people will grow cold. This is why many people within the medical, political, and religious arenas, as well as in the general population these days, act the way they act. Because they don't have love. They only seek to benefit themselves, not others. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 5 defines love in the following way. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act disgracefully. It does not seek its own benefit. It does not seek its own benefit. It is not provoked. It does not keep an account of a wrong suffered. But while these people are without love, they do, however, according to 2 Timothy, have love for themselves and for money. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 4 says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. There will be terrible times in the last days. Why? Because people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So during these last days, we shouldn't be surprised that people are lovers of themselves only and do not care about other people. We shouldn't be surprised that they're lovers of money. We shouldn't be surprised that they're proud, brutal, and that they're lovers of pleasure, meaning totally hedonistic. Because God warned us that this type of supercilious behavior would be running rampant at this time. Therefore, we should not be afraid of them. And even though the scripture speaks about the rebellious people of today, don't forget, rebellious people have always existed. For example, Ezekiel 2.6 says that when Ezekiel was faced with the rebellious crowd of his day, he was told, and you, son of man, be not afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with you, and you sit on scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, for they are a rebellious house. Therefore, as believers, we also should not be afraid of their words, nor should we be dismayed, or in other words, lose our courage by their prideful and arrogant looks. Instead, we just need to look to the scriptures and to the Lord as to how to deal with each situation. And what do the scriptures say about pride? Amongst other things, the scriptures say that pride ends in humiliation. Pride ends in humiliation. Proverbs 29, 22 through 23 says, An angry person starts fights. A hot-tempered person commits all kinds of sin. Pride ends in humiliation, while humility brings honor. Pride ends in humiliation, while humility brings honor. So, for example, remember the story of Haman in the Bible? Haman was filled with pride and arrogance. His main agenda was to murder all the Jews. And not only that, he was so filled with pride and arrogance that he wanted to be publicly honored and exalted in the streets. He wanted to be revered as powerful so that people would laud over him. Yet in the end, the plan he devised through his lies in order to receive such public honor actually ended in his complete humiliation. In the end, he got exactly the opposite of exaltation. 
he was humiliated. In fact, he was so humiliated that he hid his face and ran home in tears. Esther 6, 12 through 13 says, Haman hurried to his house mourning and with his head covered. He was crying and he was embarrassed. He was humiliated. Yes, pride will always end in humiliation, no matter how long it takes. Pride will always end in humiliation. Why? Because God hates pride and arrogance. Matthew 23, 12 says, Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. This is why you should be more afraid of God than of the looks of angry, hot-tempered, prideful, arrogant, brutal people who want to be exalted and who love themselves, money, and pleasure above anything or anyone else, including God. In fact, Proverbs 29, 25 says, Fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. Fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. Why is fearing people a dangerous trap? What is so dangerous about it? Because we're in the last days. So if you fear the looks, words, and deeds of the rebellious house of these last days, of people who are angry, hot-tempered, prideful, arrogant, brutal people who want to be exalted, who love themselves, money, and pleasure above anything or anyone else, and who have no regard for God whatsoever, then out of fear, you will conform and you will do whatever it is that they tell you to do, trusting that they have your best interest at heart, when the complete opposite of that is true. In truth, you will follow them right into whatever dangerous tra trap they have set for you. And this is not a safe thing to do. The scripture says that trusting in the Lord means safety, not trusting in people. So do not fear rebellious people who make threats and who come against you to take away your God-given rights as a child of God. Trust in the Lord your God and do whatever it is that He tells you to do and He will keep you safe.